Christine and Peter Katoa. Today is an auspicious day. We are delighted to host external affairs minister, Jai Shanga, the first such visit in more than 20 years. For students of history, the last such ministerial visit was in 2001 and was hosted by former Minister for Foreign Affairs, Phil Goff. He's a long-time friend of India and the Indian people and today is making his second to last working day as the Mayor of Auckland. Our relationship endures through the tides of history because India is one of the most important partners that we have. The reopening of borders is a welcome opportunity to re-engage with our Indian friends on our home soil, our Tūrunga Waiwai. Minister, you and I have already had the good fortune to meet in far-flung Paris and Kigali in Rwanda earlier this year. But your visit to New Zealand comes at a special time in the India-New Zealand relationship. We have a lot to learn from you and also the perspectives that you have around a really complex set of challenges that the world is facing. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the formal diplomatic relationship between India and Aotearoa New Zealand. To put it in perspective, our formal diplomatic relationship was established in the same year Queen Elizabeth began her reign. We may, we may both have our own complicated historical relationships with the UK, but we recognise the immense legacy she has created for us through our shared membership of the Commonwealth. We both heard the new king speak to Chogun members in Rwanda with a commitment to modernise the Commonwealth that will rely on our contribution alongside other members of the Commonwealth family. He noted that to unlock the power of our common future, we must also acknowledge the wrongs which have shaped our past. He spoke of colonisation and he spoke of slavery, and he understood the challenge in front of him, of the need for ongoing reconciliation. It is true. Relationships require attention and nurturing, and I hope that our relationship will see a fruition for both New Zealand and India. During these past 70 years, New Zealand and India have worked closely together to build a close friendship and a deep relationship. But like all relationships, it's people who form the integral bridge between our two countries. We want to take this even further, and I know that you're committed to that. Today we've discussed a range of opportunities for expanding our relationship, like fence, security, cooperation, people to people links, sporting and cultural links, and new areas such as climate change and sustainable agriculture. So in closing, I want to draw on the wisdom of the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, David Longy, possibly the man responsible for the most significant improvements in the India-New Zealand relationship. His instructions to the newly appointed High Commissioner Edmund Hillary in 1985 was simple. Do whatever you think is best. So that's the motto we can all live by and I'm certainly going to do that in our relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, let me begin by saying uh, what a great pleasure it is for me to be in New Zealand. Uh, and uh, I, I echo your sense of this being part of a continuing conversation between us, which actually began with some uh, telephone calls, I think, uh, uh, during the COVID, uh, the more intense COVID period, and then, as you recall, we met in Paris and then in Tigali. I see this not just as a visit, uh, but really uh, an endeavor by two countries, uh, very respectful of each other's traditions and culture, very conscious of their diverse uh, nature to forge a more contemporary relationship. Mm. And a more contemporary one because uh, I think we do recognize today that uh, countries like India and New Zealand have a particular <coughs> responsibility in uh, forging a post-colonial order uh, which is uh, fairer, uh, which is more equitable. Uh, and which will uh, provide the prosperity and stability uh, to large parts of the world with which we are historically linked. Uh, in terms of our meeting today, uh, obviously a large part of our conversation went to strengthening our bilateral relationship. 
And uh, the sum and substance of it was really an understanding that we should play to each other's strengths, uh, which specifically meant uh, business, uh, education, uh, technology, the digital world, agricultural trade, uh, talent, and most of all, people-to-people uh, -people connect, because that's at the heart uh, of uh, both our societies. Uh, we spoke a bit about uh, the need for better air connectivity. Uh, I also raised with the minister concerns which some of our students have faced, uh, students uh, who had to leave New Zealand during the COVID period uh, and uh, who uh, when didn't have uh, the, uh, the opportunity to get their visas renewed. Uh, I urged uh, a fairer and more sympathetic treatment for them. Uh, also, uh, students who are waiting to come to New Zealand to pursue their studies uh, and uh, whether uh, the, the visa process for them could be hastened. Uh, we uh, also touched upon uh, the skills uh, demand in each society. There are uh, perhaps uh, demands in New Zealand uh, which would, uh, could be met out of India. Uh, and uh, we have a mobility understanding with many countries, so uh, the possibility whether uh, you know, those could serve as guidance for uh, progress between us. Uh, there was also a, a very open discussion on how India and New Zealand together uh, we shape the larger region, the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, uh, there was a discussion on, on uh, uh, some current, some pressing issues like uh, the situation, the, the security situation in the Indo-Pacific, uh, the consequences of the Ukraine conflict. Uh, and naturally, uh, we, we uh, spent some time on the major global issues, uh, uh, most of all uh, climate action, climate justice. Uh, some, uh, some of the initiatives which India uh, has uh, uh, been uh, sponsoring over the last few years, the International uh, Solar Alliance, the Coalition for the Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, uh, the, uh, the uh, initiative for the resilient uh, island uh, states, uh, and and uh, the importance uh, of collaborating, uh, not just bilaterally, but with other countries uh, to deal with uh, contingencies like pandemics, which we know uh, will surely recur at some point in time. Uh, and of course, uh, other, other common concerns, maritime security, uh, for example. So uh, all in all, uh, I, I would say it's been a minister, uh, a very uh, good uh, uh, day of uh, uh, discussions and exchange of views uh, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm really very pleased to, today to uh, find some way of uh, contributing to the strengthening of our ties. Uh, we would be very honored if uh, uh, we have the privilege of receiving you, Minister, in India. I hope not in the very distant future. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think uh, th this, this evening uh, I have the opportunity uh, to, to spend time with the Indian community uh, which has done so much to be a living bridge uh, between us. Uh, I hope I will have the opportunity of meeting the Prime Minister uh, on that occasion as well. And spending a little time uh, in New Zealand, uh, including uh, in inaugurating our new embassy premises uh, in Wellington. So once again, very good to be here, and thank you for the warmth of your reception and the uh, productivity of our talks. Thank you. All right, we can take some questions. Thank you. Question to you, uh, our Minister. For 15 years, there have been study groups to consider a free trade <coughs> agreement with India. We have not been able to achieve much. How far is your government willing to move forward relaxing some of your rigid conditions for a fair trade agreement with India? A fair trade agreement at this time is not uh, a priority for New Zealand or, or India. However, that hasn't uh, stopped us from trying to find ways where there are other uh, opportunities uh, to work together to derive some mutual benefit. 
uh, in terms of economic relationships. And that's the, been the nature of our uh, conversation today, is can we seek out further opportunities to gain uh, mutual benefit uh, in our economic relationships? The Minister this morning uh, spent time talking to a business uh, uh, community, uh, our business community. Uh, I think we have identified that there are niche areas where we, where we can absolutely derive uh, mutual benefit in the digital space, uh, in uh, spaces where we can maybe share innovation that will contribute uh, to some of our uh, uh, joint ambitions. So that's been really the very, very focus of our uh, discussion. Is FDA off the table, Minister? It's not our priority right at this moment. Minister Jai Shank, I just was hoping to get your response to that as well in terms of the free trade deal. Uh, I think the Minister and I uh, uh, exchanged views on this subject and uh, <coughs> we felt that uh, perhaps the best way of pursuing economic opportunities right now uh, was to encourage uh, more business collaborations. Uh, I use that word, uh, that phrase, playing to our strengths. Uh, we certainly believe that uh, there's a lot that uh, New Zealand businesses have to offer to India. Uh, I'm sure that feeling is reciprocated on the New Zealand side. So at the moment, uh, the focus, the priority would be on enhancing business collaboration. Mr. Shankar, if you can please elaborate on what confidence were you give, given when you spoke about people who have lost livelihoods during COVID times who had returned and who could not come back right now. And Minister Mahmoud, can you also please elaborate on your press release you've mentioned about changing of immigration settings. Can you please elaborate on those? Well, the immigration uh, settings have changed partly as a result of COVID. So, for example, even a number of domestic students during that COVID period had to access their learning online. And we found that we had to adjust in so many ways across society in the way that we were working. I, in, in terms of our immigration settings, although this is a matter for our immigration minister, he's signalled that in the immigration reset, we need to consider where we are now and how we look at immigration settings to support some of the challenges that, we've, that we have. For example, we do face a skill shortage in some key areas. We need to consider the way in which we uh, seek talent back into New Zealand in critical areas of need. Uh, and then there are opportunities that we've uh, considered in areas where specific industries uh, are calling out for uh, workforce uh, due to the challenges of getting produce to market. Again, that's a a part of a live conversation that we're having. <coughs> uh, I have registered the views that the Minister raised uh, and, under, and undertake to take that back to our Minister of Immigration. So what you have mentioned in your, in, your, um, in your press release was a guaranteed pathway to residency that, that, that was also discussed with Minister Shankar. Um, do you want to touch on that? In a, more strategic, in a more strategic sense, our immigration reset enables the full consideration of how we orient <coughs> our view to bringing people to New Zealand or securing talent to New Zealand and being able to then ensure that there is a pathway uh, to citizenship. And again, this is a matter that our Minister of Immigration is working on. Two more questions. Let me uh, only add that uh, I flagged for the Minister's consideration the predicament of students who had to go back during the COVID period. And I obviously urged that uh, uh, their, uh, their situation be treated sympathetically and with fairness. Uh, and also the students who are waiting to come uh, to this country. And, uh, you know, all of us uh, in different governments across the world are uh, struggling to restore, you know, pre-COVID processes. So, so uh, uh, I'm uh, very confident that, uh, uh, you know, the government of New Zealand would uh, take uh, the situation of the students into account and respond to that. So you that's contend that something fruitful, something fruitful, fruitful will come out of this? You contend that something fruitful will let, come let out of this? Let me respond to that. I've given the Minister an undertaking that the concerns that he has raised, we have registered and will certainly take that back to our Minister of Immigration, but he's made the point very clearly. Yeah, no. My question is for the Visiting Minister. Right. One, of, one of you needs to. Yeah, so why did it take uh, the Indian Foreign Minister to visit New Zealand over 20 years? And also, is your ministry aware of uh, some very strong anti-India fringe groups working in New Zealand, abusing the democratic freedom of this country and constantly working 
against the Indian nation. Is your ministry aware of doing anything about it? You know, uh, uh, I can only say in fairness, uh, I've been minister for a little more than three years. Uh, two and a half of those three years, unfortunately, uh, were impacted by the COVID. Uh, it's been my in intention since becoming foreign minister to make a visit. And perhaps even in my first conversation with my counterpart, I told her that as soon as the situation normalizes, uh, uh, I would like to be. So I would uh, uh, really suggest that the focus should be on the fact that I'm here and not on the fact that, you know, some others were not here. Uh, on uh, the uh, on the issue of uh, you know uh, what you call print, you, know, you mentioned fringe elements and uh, their opinion. Look, uh, in democratic societies, and I'm not making this point specifically in regard to New Zealand. Democratic societies need to be cognizant uh, of the possibilities, but the very freedoms that define them can be misused. So they, they need to be sensitive to that. They need to, uh, to uh, be uh, aware, particularly when it impacts other relationships. Uh, so, uh, so I make that as a general point. Uh, uh, so I think it would be best to leave it there. My, my view on the, on the question is that New Zealand is a diverse society and there's a low tolerance for fringe elements who seek to dis disenfranchise communities based on their ethnicity or religion. No tolerance. And we, as a fair society, we have to keep promoting the values that we see ourselves as representing, which is an inclusive society that is here for the benefit of all New Zealanders. Minister Mahuta, do you value the relationship with India and art? Australia seems to be a bit further ahead. <coughs> We're not in competition with Australia. Uh, in fact, we just want to ensure that the quality of the relationship that we have with India at this point in time fairly reflects opportunities that exist now and is mutually beneficial. And we have a great regard for the contribution that India makes to our border region and, and the way in which it reflects uh, its ambition to some common principles of peace, stability, prosperity. And uh, you will see as a result of that common approach for our broader region, New Zealand wanting to ensure that we take every moment we have going forward to improve uh, this relationship. It's important to us. Mr. Sanka, it seems like you agree with that, uh, with the journalist there saying that Australia is a bit ahead. No, I was just going to tell him you are Richard Hadley, so what more do you want? Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming out. One more question, one last one. Okay? Uh, so, and congratulations, and thank you for Operation Ganga, sir. And there's one statement you mentioned that uh, being in a Modi government itself is a great strength as a foreign minister. So, what is that strength? You know, uh, look, as a as a foreign minister, uh, it's it's obviously enormously helpful to be part of a government uh, which has a very strong mandate, uh, which has a prime minister with a very uh, clear vision uh, and a very strong commitment, not just to our national uh, growth, but frankly for a better world. Now, if you want to hear a more expanded version of this answer, I would suggest you join me for the function this evening. I'll be speaking well, on that. Thank you. Sir. Sir, one question.